Where? Yeah. Which com which company? We have not mentioned the name yet. Hmm. Online or face to face? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Come. Come here. Okay, open it. Okay, uh, okay, 
Okay, second chapter. Although we are unable to glorify you adequately, we nonetheless have a transcendental taste to glorify your activities. We shall try to glorify your activities. We shall try to glorify you according to the instructions received from authorized sages and scholars. Whatever we speak, however, is always inadequate and very insignificant. This is how the sutras, they prayed to King Prathu, but that is applicable in our expression of uh, appreciation of Prabhupada. Encouragement and humiliation. Although Srila Prabhupada taught by constantly giving encouragement to his disciples, he could also teach by humiliating them and thus very quickly bringing them to a better self-awareness. Many devotees give testimonies of these sometimes brief but powerful moments with Prabhupada. Once on a walk along Juhu Beach with Srila Prabhupada, Giriraj Das was describing the preaching he had done to newspaper men. Yes, you are a very good public, good public relations man, said Srila Prabhupada, which made Giriraj feel highly elated. A little later, the discussion turned to humility. Giriraj said that sometimes he felt he wasn't really doing anything for Krishna and the Krishna consciousness movement. That is good, said Prabhupada. That feeling is humbleness. But sometimes, said Giriraj, that feeling is turned into Maya. Srila Prabhupada stopped walking and looked abruptly at his disciple. Being turned into Maya, said Prabhupada, you are always in Maya. These words hit Giriraj so strongly that he immediately offered obeisances before Srila Prabhupada. He had suddenly realized his actual position and had gained a glimpse of Srila Prabhupada's position as a spiritual master. Another time, Navayogendra Das got a dose of the same medicine. He was chanting in a room with Srila Prabhupada, who pointed out that Navayogendra's bead bag was on the floor. No, Prabhupada, it's on my chadar, said Navayogendra. But you walk on that chadar, you walk on that chadar, Prabhupada said. You have no respect for your bead bag? Navayogendra accepted the criticism, but took heart and began chanting loudly. Then Prabhupada remarked, don't chant so loudly. So now Yogendra began to chant quietly. But Prabhupada said, if you are chanting, you should not disturb the spiritual master. On a morning walk into the fields near Bhaktivedanta Manor in England, Rohini Nandan Das, his first face-to-face -face exchange with Srila Prabhupada got a similar treatment. Prabhupada and the devotees were walking down the narrow, winding country road when they came upon a sign that said, Horticultural Show. Prabhupada pointed to the sign with his cane and said, What is horticultural? The devotees stopped walking. But no one said anything until Rohini Nandan spoke from the back of the group. Chila Prabhupada, he said, I think it means fruits and flowers and vegetables growing. Prabhupada turned quickly and looked back at Rohini Nandan. You think? You, don't, you do not know? You think? Rohini Nandan bashfully hung his head and became speechless while everyone else gathered around, looking from Rohini Nandan to Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada banged his cane on the ground and repeated, You think? You do not know? Rohini Nandan did not take the reprimand lightly. He felt that a whole lifetime's pride of, I think, had been smashed to pieces by Prabhupada. In fact, one of the reasons uh, why we accept a spiritual master is so that we get trained um, 
to develop the right attitude tranada bi suri chena taroro bi sahishna amane na amana de na kitni sadahari when a disciple wrote to prabhupad saying how is it that in shikshashtakam uh, such an important teaching that one must accept a spiritual master does not feature i'm paraphrasing and then prabhupad said Oh, there is this verse, Trinada Pisuni Chena Taroro Pisaishana Amani Namana Dena Kirtaniya Sadahari. That is impossible without a spiritual master. You can't just read some book and, and develop these attitudes. You need to be trained. And for that, uh, the bona fide spiritual master trains his disciples, and the bona fide spiritual servant uh, accepts it. You do not know the process. Many devotees saw Shri Prabhupada drive away small and large dogs by raising his cane and crying, "Hut!" When Nandakumar was traveling with Prabhupada, he saw Prabhupada do this in a dangerous situation, and later he had the opportunity to try the technique himself. What is this? Okay, now let's start. while prabhupada and the devotees were walking on the beach in california a large dover man in shirt approached him snarling and baring his teeth prabhupada continued walking peacefully but nandakumar stopped and tensely faced the dog this challenge only provoked the dog into more threatening and growling until nandakumar turned and ran to catch up to prabhupada as soon as he ran the dover man in shirt pursued him barking and threatening to attack before the dog reached him however prabhupad suddenly turned he crouched with his feet somewhat apart raised his cane high over his head and gave a loud hut and made a growling sound at the dog at this display from prabhupad the dog turned and retreated quickly back to its house months later Nandakumar recalled Shri Prabhupada's method and tried it on a large monkey in Jaipur. While Shri Prabhupada was staying at the Radha Govinda Temple in Jaipur, he and his party were being harassed by the monkeys there, who stole food and clothes. While the devotees were cooking, these monkeys would drop from the trees and steal chapatis off the stove. Prabhupada had advised the monkeys, uh, had advised the devotees, sorry, to take a neutral attitude toward the monkeys' mischief. But one time. while with the devotees in prabhupada's room nandakumar heard a monkey rattling the kitchen door he suddenly remembered the technique prabhupada had used on the beach with the large dover man picture and he decided to try it with the thieving monkey quietly excusing himself from the room he picked up a club outside prabhupada's door and walked towards a large monkey who was just opening the kitchen door Nanda Kumar raised the club over his head, crouched, and growled. The monkey, who had noticeably big biceps, growled back, bared his teeth, and advanced toward him. Nanda Kumar turned and ran back into Prabhupada's room, slamming the door behind him. Prabhupada had seen the whole incident through the window and burst out laughing. you do not know the process nandakumar sat down in embarrassment his imitation had failed prabhupad said nandakumar you have a special potency apart from the comic relief it is a fact that mere imitation of prabhupad his preaching method and so on will not necessarily lead to the same results potency i will live in a simple hut in 1971 when the iskon mayapur project was in its beginning st- stages robert met with a group of devotee planners to design the first buildings included in the plans was a residential building for shila prabhupad which the devotees took a special pleasure in discussing it would be a wonderful home for their spiritual master shila prabhupad had also agreed that the spiritual master's residence should be built Even before the construction of the magnificent temple for Radha Krishna, 
But one time when the devotees went before Prabhupada to discuss his residence, they were surprised to find that he was not interested. I don't require a house, said Prabhupada. The devotees were baffled. But this has been part of the planning all along. He repeated that. I do not want a house. But you'll have to live somewhere. I will live in a simple hut. The planners went away from this conversation, confused about how to construct the Mayapur city without a place for Srila Prabhupada. But after conferring among themselves, they realized the defect wasn't there presenting the idea to Prabhupada. So they went back and tried again. Srila Prabhupada, Mayapur is a central place for our movement. People and people must learn to worship the Guru there. So we would like to show you the plans for your residential building. In this way, by making a nice place, the whole Vaishnava Sampradaya will be honored. Yes, that's true. Prabhupada now agreed and discussions about his residence continued in a positive way. As long as the discussions had been whether or not Prabhupada would like to have a big house, he had not shown enthusiasm. But when the plan was presented as service to Krishna, Prabhupada's interest was strong. We should not separate the spiritual master from Krishna. It's one of the teachings that Prabhupada repeatedly gave to the world through his disciples. Service to the spiritual master is meant to be done in conjunction with service to Krishna in a manner that is pleasing to Krishna. The Sahaja tendency is to take everything cheaply. The Prabhupada noted symptoms of Prakrita Sahajiya, the tendency to take devotion service cheaply and to imitate the realizations of highly advanced devotees in one of his artist disciples. And he gave him early warnings of danger. One time in Vrindavan, the artist brought a sketch before Shila Prabhupada for his approval. Before beginning a serious painting, Shila Prabhupada's first remark was, is this Shiva and Parvati? No, Shila Prabhupada, it is Radha Krishna. They look too old, said Srila Prabhupada. They should look no more than 16 years old, very fresh youth. The artist went back to work and read the sketch. But when Prabhupada saw it the second time, he again said the couple looked too old. He then showed his disciple a picture on his desk of the Iskon Calcutta deities, Radha Govinda. And he said they should be painted like this. Krishna is a young, sweet boy. For the third time, the artist did the sketch and showed it to Srila Prabhupada. The Prabhupada was still unenthusiastic, but since he did not specifically forbid the work, the artist took this as his permission and began work on a large canvas. After weeks of work, he brought his opus before Srila Prabhupada. The painting showed Radha and Krishna on a swing. Krishna was lifting Radha on his veil and looking into her face in a very intimate, conjugal way. The more traditional elements of Radha and Krishna standing together, appearing in the artist's preliminary sketches, had evolved into a scene more imagined by the artist. It is concoction, said Srila Prabhupada. Despite all the effort put into it by the artist, Srila Prabhupada couldn't spare feelings on such an important responsible matter as the depiction of Radha and Krishna. In a mood of hurt pride, the artist took back the painting and did not inquire further about what was wrong or what he should do to rectify it. That's already a problem. On another occasion in Mayapur, Prabhupada alerted the same artist that his spontaneous expression was unauthorized. While painting large portraits from the Chaitanya Charitamrita on the boundary wall to Iskon Mayapur, the artist had created his own Bengali, his own original Bengali verse and painted it in large script. When Srila Prabhupada first noticed it while on a morning walk, he became disturbed. You should not have dared, he said. The verse employed a metaphor praising Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda. Prabhupada said the sentiment wasn't bad, although the Bengali wasn't perfect. But the main objection was that his disciple had dared to put his own verse on the wall rather than one provided by the previous acharyas, such as Narutam Das Thakur. Well, Prabhupada even mentioned the incident in that morning Bhagavatam's class. Don't concoct he said, the Sahaja tendency is to take everything cheaply. Don't do this, Prabhupada, said Prabhupada, or you will become a Sahaja and everything will be ruined.
Anika Dundavidar's interview. This incident has a disastrous but instructive follow-up. Although Prabhupada's warnings had pointed to the danger in his disciples' actions, the artist devotee wandered away from Prabhupada's instructions and became the disciple of Vrindavan Babaji and engaged in sinful activities and engaged his wife in sinful activities also. If you don't accept Prabhupada, that's what happens. Little drops of nectar. While Prabhupada was living in Los Angeles in 1969, he got a letter from one of his relatives stating that one of his brothers had died. Prabhupada received this information in the presence of some of the devotees and he informed them. I have just received this letter saying that my brother died. Previously, my other brother died. These two brothers were very nice. They wanted to live long, healthy lives. But they didn't care so much for Krishna consciousness. But my sister and I, Prabhupada, laughed softly. We didn't want to live long, healthy lives. We only wanted to do some service. And when Krishna wanted to, he would take us. Now I see that my two brothers are both dead. And my sister and I are living long, happy lives. Well, Prabhupada was very fond of Mr. Panilal Piti, a friend from Hyderabad. One time, Mr. Piti came to Bombay and dropped in unexpectedly to visit Prabhupada. Prabhupada had just begun his lunch. He was glad to see his friend, however, and asked him to sit down and have lunch with him. Prabhupada told his cook, Palika, to make up a plate for Mr. Piti. He stared back silently at Prabhupada because she had hardly any extra food for serving another person. But Prabhupada looked back steadily at her and again asked her to make the extra plate. Palika came in with a plate as best she could arrange for Mr. Piti. Mr. Piti then got up to go to another room to wash his hands. As soon as Mr. Piti left the room, Chila Prabhupada, with the demeanor of a surreptitious child, took the bowl of yogurt from his plate and quickly put it onto Mr. Piti's plate before he could come back and see. Prabhupada's disciple, Subhag Das, Subhag Swami Maharaj, tells of his first meeting with Prabhupada. Prabhupada noticed him in the temple room and asked him his name. Subhag answered with a few words in Bengali. Oh, you're a Bengali, said Prabhupada. Come to my room. Subhag followed as Shila Prabhupada entered his room. There Prabhupada began changing his clothes. Keeping his body always covered with cloth, he removed the dhoti while putting on his gamsha in preparation for his massage. Prabhupada continued talking affectionately, asking Subhag about his life. Subhag began to feel that he was talking with a near and dear family relative and affectionate, respected grandfather. It was as if he had known Srila Prabhupada a long time, although he had been in Prabhupada's association for only a moment. While Prabhupada's servant knelt beside Prabhupada, and began massaging his head, Prabhupada began to explain Krishna consciousness to the newcomer. The incident about Srila Prabhupada's brother is from Nandarani Devidasi. By depending on Krishna, Prabhupada not only got long life, but everything materially and spiritually, which his family members could never get by all their endeavors in the material world. The incident with Mr. P.T is from Palika Devi Dasi interview. The third incident is from Subhag Das interview. Shila Prabhupada said on management, Prabhupada advised that those who are leaders in ISKCON have to know how to bend men without breaking them or making them angry. After all, he said, it is all voluntary service. George Harrison once said, in the future, ISKCON will be so large, it will require executive management. Prabhupada replied, I've, di I've divided the world into zones and representatives. As long as they keep to the spiritual principles, Krishna will help them. A disciple with managerial responsibility approached Prabhupada and expressed a desire to leave India. Prabhupada asked him to stay on, but the disciple was, but the devotee was determined to leave, and ultimately Prabhupada conceded. But at one point, Prabhupada said, You can renounce management. 
but I cannot. I have to stay and manage. Once on a visit to Boston, Shila Prabhupada had a meeting with his, his con press workers. Satsuru Das complained to Prabhupada that he had so many duties in the temple that he was distracted in trying to do all of them and at the same time also do press work. Prabhupada said, real management means to delegate it to others. You have so many responsible devotees there, so you can delegate it to them. While walking up the stairs in Mayapur one morning, Prabhupada began complimenting Bhavananda Goswami. You are a good manager because you keep things clean. If you can keep everything clean, then you are a good manager. That's all there is to it. As they walked up the stairs, Prabhupada could see that everything was shiny and clean. The walls, the pictures on the walls, the marble floors, everything was clean. When they went to the roof, however, the Prabhupada found a scrap of paper and dust in a corner. And he began to criticize everyone for neglect. Once in India, Prabhupada was joined in his room by his senior disciples, Bhagavan, Brahmananda and Giriraj. You are the future and hope of the world, said Srila Prabhupada. And he began to instruct them about the importance of attentive management. Just like your American Express Corporation, he said. What have they done? They have simply taken pieces of paper and for those pieces of paper, you pay good money. But what have they done? Actually, they've done nothing. It is simply management. You pay them some money and they give you a piece of paper. And if you lose that piece of paper, they say, all right, we'll give you another piece of paper. It is organization. Simply from that management, they've made millions of dollars. Land, labor, capital, organization, these four are required in preaching. Of course, apart from purity. Without purity, there's no question of effective preaching. In Calcutta, when Abhiram Das was the temple president, he went one day to tell Srila Prabhupada that he was having difficulty with his marriage. Prabhupada asked him, what was the difficulty? She wants that I should be engaged in more pujari work and chanting rather than management. Srila Prabhupada replied, she is less intelligent. Management is spiritual activity, just like Arjuna was fighting. There is no difference between chanting Hare Krishna or Sankirtan and doing one's assigned work in Krishna consciousness. Sometimes you have to do so much managerial or office work. But Lord Chaitanya promises us that because in the Kali Yuga this is required for carrying out the preaching mission, he gives assurance that we will not become entangled by such work. When the work has to be done, do it first, then chant. But you must fulfill at least 16 rounds daily. So if necessary, sleep less. But you have to finish your minimum number of rounds. This was Prabhupada's way of getting things done. Um, Brahmacharya, Grasa, Svanaprasa, Sanyasis, everyone should just assist him, sacrifice their lives to assist him. In fact, Krishna will take care. And Prabhupada's disciples, even now, they recollect that during those days, there was no guarantee where they would get money and so on. But they were happy. They were peaceful. That they were under the care of Lord Krishna. Sir, which caste do you belong to? Hila Prabhupada would speak from a large repertoire, a reservoir of traditional stories and apply them in different ways. His use of the story about the Brahmin who lost his caste illustrates this nicely. In India, there's a custom that Hindus never take their meals in the house of a Mohammedan or a Christian or anyone other than a Hindu Brahmin. But one Brahmin was very hungry and he went to a little known acquaintance and asked for some food. The man supplied the Brahmin with a little food stuff, but still his hunger was not satisfied. When the Brahmin asked the man for more food, the man said he was sorry, but he had no more. Oh, said the Brahmin, disappointed. Then he asked, sir, which caste do you belong to? I'm Mohammedan, the man replied. Then the hungry man lamented, oh, I've lost my caste and still I'm hungry. I, I have lost it in both ways. Chila Prabhupada told this story on one occasion to a devotee artist. 
she had suggested to Prabhupada that she should improve her artistic craftsmanship by painting and selling non-devotional pictures. And then after becoming talented and famous, she could better paint for Krishna. The Prabhupada replied that to come to the point of being a reputed artist would take a long time. But a devotee's time is short and is only for serving Krishna. Our talents are only for serving Krishna. As for fame, Prabhupada said, according to Chaitanya Chaitamrita, a man is famous who is known as a great devotee of Krishna. If she insisted on becoming a great, art, uh, becoming a great artist, she would be like the Brahman who lost his caste, but his belly remained unfulfilled. Another time, Prabhupada applied the same story when a devotee at Prabhupada's suggestion tried to get Prabhupada the teaching position on a college faculty. The salary they offered him was very low, so Prabhupada rejected it. The devotee then thought, that he had insulted Prabhupada by even asking such a thing. Prabhupada wrote back, assuring the disciple that there was no offense, but that the offer was useless. He related the story about the caste Brahmin, then commented, the idea is that if we have to ask some service, there must be proper remuneration. So I thought that since I required some money for my book fund, I might gather some money in this way, but this does not satisfy my hunger. So forget this incident. Personal, his personal remnants. Once after a servant shaved his hair, Prabhupada noticed that he was saving little bits of gray hair. What are you doing with that? The servant replied that he was saving it as remnants. Prabhupada said, it is muchi, unclean. Hair is muchi. But when the servant insisted that the disciples worship it, Prabhupada laughed and said, all right, when... He received extra sweaters as gifts. He would carry them for a while in the suitcase and then personally give them away. He gave away gold rings, once giving one each to his servant and his servant's wife on the occasion of their marriage. He carried watches and bead bags and gave them all away. He gave everything away bit by bit and always he received more. What we gave him transformed into his charity to others while the personal effects he kept were very few. His personal items were very few. He liked to give prasadam from his hand and everyone liked to receive it. It was not just food, but the blessings of bhakti, the essence of devotion service. Shri Prabhupada took out prasadam happily, calmly, and without discrimination. When he gave to children, they liked the sweet taste of it in the form of a cookie or sweet meat. Yet also they liked it as a special treat from Prabhupada, who sat on the Vyasasan, leaning toward them. Women liked it because they got a rare chance to come forward and extend their hands before Prabhupada. They felt satisfied and chaste. And stalwart men came forward like expectant children, sometimes pushing one another just to get the mercy from Prabhupada. To Prabhupada, it was serious and important. And he would personally supervise to make sure that a big plate was always ready for him to distribute. He wrote in Srimad Bhagavatam, purport, no Vedic sacrifice is complete without distribution of prasadam. Although now prasadam distribution in the, in the Krishna consciousness movement is done on a huge scale as Prabhupada decided, it all started from his own hand as he gave it out one to one. Come, he would say, take prasad. The fortunate receiver would extend his arm, the right hand, palm up, and Prabhupada touched him or her with a small amount of foodstuffs. It fully satisfied the mind, body, and soul with his deft hands and shapely fingers selecting pieces from the plate. He gave it out. He knew that the urchins in Bombay and Bhuvaneshwar were coming mainly because their bellies were hungry. And he also arranged to give out thousands of full plates of ichri in Mayapur. In the USA, he introduced delicious vegetarian loafies teaching Westerners the art of cooking and eating. So all prasadam distribution goes back to the simple act initiated by Prabhupada, his offering his remnants. No guest could leave his room without it. Even a hostile onlooker. Come, please take. Prasadam distribution has to be mixed with distribution of Krishna's holy names and Prabhupada's books. Why are you using frozen vegetables? One time, 
while traveling on a train in India, Prabhupada asked for samosas and the devotees purchased a bag full. Then one of the women began arranging to offer the food as prasadam for Prabhupada and the devotees. In the presence of Prabhupada, she stood up and began to make a place for an offering. She put down a cloth and placed Krishna's picture there, got a plate and proceeded to prepare an offering. Prabhupada was watching, but before she had placed the plate down on the improvised altar, he stopped her. This is not the way to offer, he said. In front of all these people, Prabhupada quoted a Sanskrit verse, beginning, Dravyam Mulyena Shudhyati. When a thing is purchased, even if its source is not pure, it can be offered to Krishna. He also stated that sometimes, in awkward circumstances, a devotee may have to offer food to Krishna mentally as long as it is not forbidden food. Items are purified uh, by purchase. See, there are two ways you can get items. You can get it by charity or you can purchase it. So when you purchase, uh, even though the person from whom you got was not pure, uh, it is considered pure enough to be offered, uh, offerable to Krishna. So sometimes we may need to offer uh, in our hearts, in our minds. But even then, the foodstuff should be um, allowed foodstuff. One time in Tehran, Iran, Prabhupada showed a similar flexibility to time and place. Prabhupada's secretary had noticed that the devotees were keeping frozen vegetables in the freezer. The secretary told the devotees that they should immediately throw them all out. He said that it was offensive to the Guru to offer him vegetables that were not fresh and that they did not understand Prabhupada's instructions. You don't know how angry you would get, said the secretary, if he saw those frozen vegetables and you're even feeding them to him. Nandarani, who was living in Tehran with her husband, Dayananda, became distressed. Since she was using the frozen vegetables in her cooking for guests in the preaching dinners three nights a week, she went to Prabhupada to ask what to do. By this time, Prabhupada had already been informed by his secretary about the frozen vegetables. Why are you using frozen vegetables? He asked. Because we have dinner parties, she replied. We have to feed them something. These dinner parties are our only preaching here. If we can't feed them prasadam, then practically we have finished. That's all right, said Srila Prabhupada. You cannot get other vegetables? No, Srila Prabhupada, nothing is available here. Maybe we can feed them some potatoes. That's all right, Prabhupada said. Use frozen vegetables. It is part of our Sankirtan. You must simply become ruled by your spiritual master. According to the Bhagavatam verse, even the briefest association with the pure devotee can bring one to the perfection of human life. So the Prabhupada delivered many conditioned souls from illusion, sometimes just by his merciful glance for the person receiving his benediction. Such moments were experienced in a very personal, individual way. Yet Srila Prabhupada was able to give his blessings, even while tending to many persons at once. Jay Madhav Das was standing in a crowd of devotees while Prabhupada was getting into a car. As Prabhupada looked from the back seat at the devotees, Jay Madhav felt Prabhupada's glance fall on him. It was as if Prabhupada was saying, what are you doing here? Why are you wasting your time in the material world? This reciprocation was a deeply sobering experience. A number of disciples of Prabhupada who have reported similar uh, impactful experiences. Experiences which had a lot of impact. High impact experiences. Another devotee Pranachod had been practicing Krishna consciousness for a number of years under Srila Prabhupada's direction. But on one particular visit by Srila Prabhupada to London, Pranachod received the unforgettable boost through a brief but deep personal exchange with the spiritual master. It was in a crowded temple room. At the end of the lecture, Pranachod asked Prabhupada the question. When you become initiated by the spiritual master, does he take all of your karma, even if you might perform sinful activities? Does he take the suffering you might have received? Prabhupada replied heavily, 
you must simply become ruled by your spiritual master. Those words by Srila Prabhupada entered the heart of his disciple and his glance cut through all impersonalism. Many devotees experience the same thing. A moment or occasion which Srila Prabhupada in which they realize their eternal relationship with him and in which they rejoice to know it. Once on a morning walk in the fields near Bhaktivedanta Menon, Prabhupada was talking to a group of his disciples. Sakshi Gopal Das was also there and received a special realization. Prabhupada is explaining how each humble creature in the universe is empowered by Krishna with a small degree of his own mystical power, Achinti Shakti. Prabhupada explained that the frogs can breathe underground. The trees can eat through their feet and the grass can tolerate trampling that humans could not endure. Then Prabhupada started criticizing and laughing at the material scientists and their limited vision. By his infectious laughing, the devotees also began laughing. For a moment, Prabhupada looked directly at Sakshi Gopal, to whom it seemed the whole universe was laughing with Prabhupada at the foolishness of the puffed up materialists. In this way, another disciple suddenly met Prabhupada as if for the first time and felt unforget unforgettably grateful and convinced. This happened not only to one or two, but almost every disciple knew it and realized it in different ways. In fact, there are a number of Prabhupada disciples when they speak about Prabhupada in Mayapur and other places, um, they express this. Through his instructions, his books, his mission, and through other devotees, Shila Prabhupada constantly brought awareness of a disciple's eternal relationship with Guru and Krishna. After Prabhupada's disappearance, his association is obtainable in the same way provided the follower is submissive. As Prabhupada replied to one devotee when asked whether the spiritual master was in the heart of the disciple, yes, if you let me enter, Who has painted this one? While Srila Prabhupada lived in Mayapur, his routine was punctuated by visits and news from the various fronts in his worldwide campaign against Maya. Particularly welcome, particularly welcome moments occurred when Prabhupada received advanced copies of his books. However, when he received a copy of Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 6, Volume 3, with its cover portrait of Lord Shesha, receiving the worship from Chitraketu and the four Kumaras. Prabhupada looked at it only briefly and then went on with his routine. He went to the roof where he sat on a straw mat in the sunshine. There his servant massaged him with mustard oil. And then Prabhupada bathed to Prasadam and rested for an hour in his upstairs room. According to his regular habit, he came down from his room on the roof at about four o'clock in the afternoon and received guests in his main sitting room on the second floor. Anakadundabi, Anakadundabi Das had a small part to play in Srila Prabhupada's daily routine. As each afternoon he brought, he brought Prabhupada a fresh afternoon garland of flowers and applied Chandan paste to Prabhupada's forehead. On the day that the sixth canto of Bhagavatam arrived, Prabhupada took it up again when he came down to his room while his disciples stood by waiting with the garland, stood by waiting with the garland and Chandan paste. Prabhupada began to peruse the book in his usual manner, looking first at the illustrations. Prabhupada suddenly noticed Hanaka Dundabi and signified with a glance that he could go ahead and put on the garland and the paste. Then Prabhupada continued to look through the book. Who has painted this? Asked Prabhupada as he looked at the painting of Lord Sesha. That was done by Parikshit, said Hanaka Dundabi, who stood looking over Prabhupada's shoulder at the open book in Prabhupada's hands. Prabhupada then turned the page to a plate reproduction of Mahavishnu lying in the causal ocean, manifesting all the universes from his gigantic form. Who has painted this one? asked Prabhupada. That's by Ranchor Das, said Anakadundavi. Prabhupada then, quoted, then began quoting from the Brahma Samhita. Yasya Ganeshwa Sitakala Mathavalam Yajivan Tiloma Vilaja Jagadangana Tha. Vishnu Mahan Sai Hayasya Kala Vishesho Govinda Madhi Purusham Toham Bajam. Prabhupada was just about to turn to the next page 
when suddenly a drop of the wet chandan paste fell from Prabhupada's forehead onto the page. Anakatan Devi became frightened, expecting Prabhupada to reprimand him for making the paste so runny that it had dripped onto the book. But Prabhupada only touched it with his thumbnail and asked, What is this? Anakatan Devi explained what it was, but Prabhupada said nothing. Ordinarily, the runny paste might have been enough to draw a word of disapproval from Srila Prabhupada, but he was drawn so much into the Bhagavatam that he continued his study of the book, overlooking the spot of sandalwood paste that now adorned the page. A reader may ask, what's the point of this anecdote? The point may be stated as follows. Srila Prabhupada was so absorbed in appreciating the newly published volume of Krishna's book that he both overlooked the discrepancy caused by his servant and he overlooked that the book now had a spot on it. It is a portrait of Prabhupada in ecstatic concentration. By way of justifying this anecdote as well as others, I would like to state that the real point of the anecdote is its charm and the fact that it gives us a glimpse into Prabhupada's life. Whatever allows us to be drawn closely into Prabhupada's presence is itself worthwhile. The Vedic instruction is there, blended into Prabhupada's personal presentation of that instruction by his every act. We are confident that regarding Prabhupada, he is of the greatest stature, whether considered humanly or spiritually. So we should be confident that if we nicely tell any anecdote about Prabhupada, it will be worthwhile. I have already stated in the preface to volume one, however, that considerations of etiquette should be applied in describing the spiritual master. When I've gone ahead and told an anecdote that may possibly be misconstrued, misunderstood, I've tried to explain it more fully in these notes. In the, in the Western tradition also, it looks like anecdotes are considered really important. You can see from here. Just go everywhere and play this tape and dance. When Hridayananda Goswami was Prabhupada's secretary in Mayapur, he was pleased to see how Prabhupada liked to hear his own singing of bhajans on the tape recorder. Even while working, Prabhupada played a tape. And when the recording stopped, he asked that the other side be played again. One day, in a very jolly mood while listening to his own singing of Haraya Namah Krishna, which had full harmonium, drum, and kartal accompaniment and a strong rhythm, Prabhupada began to speak. Just go everywhere and play this tape and dance. He motioned with his hands to show how the devotee should dance. Go all around the world performing like this and people will be so much attracted that you will make a million dollars. As the GBC secretary responsible for all of South America, but then the Goswami usually served Srila Prabhupada in a mood of separation as he worked and traveled constantly on Prabhupada's behalf. He often enhanced his remembrance of Srila Prabhupada, however, by playing his tapes wherever he went, serving in separation. He felt intensely close to Srila Prabhupada as much as when he was personally with him, if not more, if not more so. Yet late at night, after the demands of traveling, preaching, and managing, Pridhananda Goswami would put on a tape of Prabhupada singing and playing harmony. And as the transcendental sound of Prabhupada entered his ears, Pridhananda felt even more increased feelings of loving reciprocation for Srila Prabhupada. Thus, Vani, service to the order of Srila Prabhupada, enhanced Vapu, service to the personal form of the spiritual master. And conversely, Vapu enhanced Vani. Here, Vani refers to Vani Seva, Vapu refers to Vapu Seva. There is no question of separation of distance between me and Krishna. When Srila Prabhupada was planning the layout of the temple room in Maya, his disciples were also taking part. One thing that we notice with Prabhupada is he is always involving his disciples and allowing them to ask all kinds of questions, talk to him. Uh, fully there. You know, he's not just sitting in an ivory tower and controlling through a huge org chart. Or chart is there. But he bypasses that org chart and directly talks to his disciples abundantly whenever he wants. 
when Srila Prabhupada was planning the layout of the temple room in Mayapur, his disciples were also taking part. Where can we build a Vyasasan? One devotee asked. Should we put it at the other end of the temple facing the deities? But another devotee objected. Isn't that too far for you, Srila Prabhupada? Will he be able to see the deities from such a distance? Srila Prabhupada replied strongly. There is no question of separation of distance between me and Krishna. So the Vyasasan was placed at the opposite end from Shishi Radha Madhav. And Prabhupada could see them very nicely. On a departure from Australia, Srila Prabhupada was waiting for his plane. Devotees had brought him a simple chair and he sat in an outdoor garden just outside the entrance to the airport, watching while hundreds of people walked in and out of the terminal. Prabhupada sometimes inquired about their appearance and their clothing styles. When he asked about the elevated shoes he saw men wearing, devotees explained that they were called stacks. Some of them are elevated five or six inches high, said Amogadas. People even twist their ankles trying to walk in them. Philip Prabhupada laughed lightly. That's a Bengali proverb. Uh, he said, do something new. In today's world, innovate. This is the mantra. That is Western civilization. And they think that God is very old, not new. The devotees are feeling awkward and apologetic that Prabhupada had to sit in such a crowded public place. One of them remarked, someday, Hello, Prabhupada, we shall have our own airport. It is our airport, he said. Everything belongs to Krishna. So it is already ours. Hello, Prabhupada said on preaching, one day in Vrindavan, Srila Prabhupada allowed a morning darshan in his room, but some of the important devotees were absent. When he asked where they were, he was told that some of the devotees were cleaning the temple. Prabhupada was surprised. Cleaning the temple? We can employ people to clean the temple. But one thing you cannot employ people to do is to preach. So they should hear from me when I'm speaking. Or how will they preach? Hearing from Prabhupada is training for preaching. Only one who has a desire to progress in Krishna consciousness and spread Krishna consciousness with no desire for dhanam, janam, sundarim, kavitam um, will be capable of preaching with purity. These other services like cleaning the temple and so on, Robert said, yeah, cook, even a manager, he said, these people can be hired. But uh, preaching has to be it can only be done by those who are who are Krishna conscious. If you feel at all indebted to me, then you should preach vigorously like me. That is the proper way to repay me. Of course, no one can repay the debt to the spiritual master, but the spiritual master is very much pleased by such an attitude by the disciple. Yes, preaching is more important than management. Just because you're preaching nicely and distributing so much prasadam, Management will follow like a shadow and Krishna will send you unlimited help. One time in Hawaii, Prabhupada was discussing how he, how he was able to defeat the non-devotees' arguments. I know the art, like karate, he said, of pushing on a weak person, on, on a person's weak spot until he dies. I find their weak point and push until they die. This is how we are meant to be preaching. First of all, preaching requires that we have an arrangement where uh, devotees are there who can spend all their time for the preaching mission 24 by 7. They could be brahmacharis, dresses, panabrasas, sannyasis, but they need to be focused on that preaching mission. That is your, you know, you cannot embark on such a serious mission if you have persons who are giving five hours a week, four hours a week, six hours a week for the preaching mission of an ISKCON center. You need to have persons who give 24 by seven. Otherwise you cannot 
even in this world, even if you want to uh, set up a company to sell some product, you need to have full-time staff. You cannot have people who give four hours a week, five hours a week. Uh, you cannot, this is not how you push through. Preaching requires in addition to purity, land, labor, capital, organization. That labor means 24 by seven, you need people. You also need part-time assistant. Everything is required, but you do need people who are full-time voluntarily committed uh, to responsibly participating in the preaching mission in every possible manner. Shila Prabhupada tells stories about lazy men. Prabhupada was annoyed when devotees in Vrindavan repeatedly walked in and out of his room and left the, left the door open behind them, letting in flies. Why are you leaving the door open? He yelled. It's a contagious disease. And then he told a story. An employer advertised for an opening in his firm and received many applications. Based on these, he selected two men and asked them to come for an interview. The employer then observed each man carefully during the interview. When the first man entered the room, he left the door open behind him. The employer spoke with him for about 15 minutes and then asked him to wait outside. When the second applicant entered, he shut the door behind him. After speaking with him, the employer asked him to also wait outside. And then he called his secretary. That first man I spoke to, he said, has all the qualifications, but I have decided to give the job to the second man. Why is that? Because the first man left the door open. It appears he's a lazy fellow. The other man shut the door. So while he may not be so qualified, he will learn quickly. In Rishikesh in 1977, Shila Prabhupada was staying with about eight of his disciples in a house on the bank of the Ganges. One day, Prabhupada entered the kitchen and was astonished to see that the devotees had cut up a huge amount of vegetables in preparation for lunch. Prabhupada said they had cut enough vegetables to feed 50 people. Commenting that his disciples had no common sense, Prabhupada then sat in a chair and began directing them in all the details of the cooking. He watched the rice boiling and tested it for softness. Then he personally cooked the chapatis. At this time, Prabhupada commented that only a lazy man cannot cook. And then, and he told the story of some lazy men. There was a king who announced that all lazy men in his kingdom could come to the charity house and be fed. Hundreds of people came. And they all said, I'm a lazy man. The king then told his minister to set fire to the charity house. Everyone inside, except two men, immediately ran out of the burning building. Of the two remaining, one man said to the other, my back is becoming very hot from the fire. The other man advised, just turn over to the other side. Seeing these two, the king said, they're actually lazy men. Feed them. So lazy. Unbelievable. Personal glimpses. Robert and his photo. His sense of personal worth and dancing. He liked the photo of himself on the back of the first Hare Krishna happening album. In that photo, his hair seems to be standing on end and his visage is grave. His appearance is very grave, penetrating, mystical. He said of that photo, a Swami should look philosophical. A disciple named Dinesh told Srila Prabhupada that he wanted a picture of him with his mudanga for a second record album, One Day Home. Prabhupada said, I'm not a professional musician that I should pose with the Mridanga. He suggested instead more formal pictures like those of his own Guru Maharaj. The Guru is in his picture. There is no difference between me and my picture, he wrote in a letter. 
Therefore, we should honor and keep pictures in that spirit. If we throw pictures this way and that way, that is offense. The name and the picture are as good as a person in the spiritual world. In the material world, either picture or person, everything is illusion. Once he explained the importance of the philosopher, philosopher in human society by a story. In England, he said, a philosopher was once invited to meet with the famous theater actor. The philosopher replied, I cannot meet with a dancing dog. Prabhupada thought of himself very humbly as a servant of the servant, delivering the message of Krishna consciousness. But because the gift of Krishna consciousness was very important, therefore he was, he was important. And he was empowered by his spiritual master to deliver it. He taught the same to us. Devotees who are serving the Lord are important. You can see his motion on films. Don't expect to see much big athletic jumping up and down. He would mostly start from the waist and shoulders, moving up and down in a rhythm with kirtan and then jump. Dancing for Prabhupada always meant upraised arms, and extended fingers, like the depiction of Gaur and Nitai. That was how he introduced dancing in his room at 26 Second Avenue, leading us around in a circle, showing how you put your left foot to the right side and how you sway back and forth with the arms always upraised. Kitananda called it the Swami step. This is how we dance. Prabhupada taught us how to dance also. Once in Chicago, he admonished boys who were twisting, disco style, emphatically from the Vyasas and he had raised up his arms. He did it once and then the dancers did not heed. He did it again like this. It would come upon him at different memorable times, walking, dancing with ecstatic kirtan at Rathyatras in London and Australia or in temple rooms packed with devotees or before thousands at outdoor pandals in India, suddenly creating waves of excitement, all devotees raising with him. He would dance and we would dance. He danced and we are dancing. You remain a rascal your whole life. Well, Prabhupada managed to encourage every one of his disciples. He made them feel they had worth, that he loved them. And he showed that he knew their particular problems. This is really important. He made them feel they had worth, that he loved them, and that he knew their particular problems. It's not simply just creating a big hula balloon and just bringing in a lot of people and just leaving it like that. There are many things that uh, need to be done. And Prabhupada was obviously he said as a Nityasiddha associate of uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Krishna. <clears throat> he showed how to take care of the disciples, devotees. Some were problem cases who could not work well with others, and some were always unsteady. One devotee with problems once came before Srila Prabhupada and pleaded for some relief. Srila Prabhupada, I would like to apologize for being so fallen and wretched. I never seem to be able to do anything right. I try to give some advice to people, but it's no use. Because even if I think I'm right, they tell me I'm wrong. I just want your forgiveness because I'm so confused. Srila Prabhupada replied, they criticize Lord Chaitanya and Krishna. The dejected devotee was astounded to hear this, but he thought, Maybe Prabhupada did not understand what he meant. Well, Prabhupada, I'm not trying to criticize Lord Chaitanya and Krishna. I'm just trying to apologize. I'm sorry that I'm so fallen, that I'm not better than I am. Prabhupada repeated. They criticized Lord Chaitanya and Krishna. Even when Lord Krishna was here, they did not accept. Only a few hundred people accepted that he was God. Everyone else was criticizing. And when Lord Chaitanya was here, they even threw a pot at Lord Nityananda. They did not like to accept him. So what to speak of you and I? The dejected disciple then became, became overwhelmed to understand that Srila Prabhupada had indeed understood him. Understood him better than he knew himself. Then what is to be done? Asked the disciple. Just go on trying? Yes, said Srila Prabhupada. 
There was a similar incident with a devotee photographer. He had trouble rising early and in controlling his tongue from overeating. He was not very regulated or prone to the philosophy, but he liked taking pictures for Srila Prabhupada's books, at which he was very good. One day, after following Srila Prabhupada to different places in his travels, uh, the photographer asked Prabhupada's permission so that he could return to his home temple, aware of his precarious, weak situation in spiritual life. He submitted himself before Srila Prabhupada, saying, Prabhupada, I'm such a rascal. It's good, said Prabhupada. You remain a rascal your whole life. This statement confused the disciple. What to make of it? Was Prabhupada delivering a curse to remain a rascal? Then Srila Prabhupada explained, Lord Chaitanya was also called a rascal. But do you know the story of Lord Chaitanya and his spiritual master? Prabhupada's photographer suddenly felt that his mind and tongue were being controlled. Because without even thinking, he began to tell the story of how Lord Chaitanya was instructed by his spiritual master that he was too foolish to understand Vedanta and that he should just chant Hare Krishna. Prabhupada smiled and said no more. In this way, another dejected disciple became pacified, realizing his lack of intelligence and the fact that his only hope was the holy name of Krishna. Srila Prabhupada's ability in these and many other cases proved that he was a great psychologist. Even when no one else could, Srila Prabhupada knew the ways and means to give a fallen servant some renewed hope and strength. Neither did he do it by resorting to the mundane techniques of personnel managers who are often cynical and manipulative. Yet on behalf of Krishna, Srila Prabhupada was expert with people. Multifaceted. Only an Acharya from the spiritual world can be like this. Not a sadhaka. The monkey has stolen my shoes. One day in Vrindavan, Prabhupada's servant Shrutakirti heard him yelling from his room on the roof. Running into the room, Shrutakirti was greeted by a shout from Prabhupada. Rascals! Prabhupada picked up a block of clay on his desk and threw it at the doorway. What's the matter? The monkey has stolen my shoes, said Srila Prabhupada. And he got up and went out the door. Get some para and get my cane, said Prabhupada. Prutikirti went off and returned with the cane and a piece of sweet while Srila Prabhupada found the monkey who was keeping just out of reach on the small concrete roof above Prabhupada's room. With his cane in hand, Prabhupada jumped and tried striking the monkey, but it kept out of reach, scampering back and forth and waving the slipper in provocation. These monkeys are such rascals, said Prabhupada, appearing serious and intent. Knowing well the monkey's game, Prabhupada asked his servant to extend the sweet as a trade for the slipper. As soon as the sweet was offered, the monkey came forward and extended the slipper. He came closer and closer, but then snatched the sweet and kept the slipper. Three times they tried the same thing and the monkey cheated and won each time. Triumphantly, the monkey sat back out of reach, growling and making grinning faces. Finally, he placed the slipper in his mouth and began chewing. Prabhupada had been keenly involved in trying to get the slippers back, but now he said, is ruin the shoe. The monkey had ripped out the heel and the inner sole stuffing. Prabhupada went back to his room and after trying a few more moves, his servant also walked away. The monkey then dropped the shoe and ran off. Later, a devotee climbed on the roof and brought Prabhupada the chewed slipper. Prabhupada decided to keep it and use it even though it was ripped and teeth marks were visible. He continued to wear it for a year after the incident. The devotees asked Prabhupada if it were true that the present-day monkeys in Vindavan were very special, were sages from past lives who had fallen down from spiritual life and who would be liberated in their next life. Prabhupada said, yes, although the monkeys are mischievous and steal food, he said, still in Goloka Vindavan, Krishna allows them to take butter and he himself distributes it. Exactly who this monkey was or what was his relationship with Prabhupada, no one could say for sure. The only thing certain was that Prabhupada considered him 
a mischievous rascal and that this incident took place in inconceivable vrindavan dham vrindavan is inconceivable mayapur vrindavan jagannathpuri these are the prime spots for gaudiya vaishnavas both for for several reasons these are the best places to execute krishna consciousness japanese landlady during a winter visit to japan proper stayed in a cottage where the walls were made of paper the landlord supplied a kerosene heater but it only warmed a small area propat wrapped himself in his grey wool chadar and went on translating the bhagavatam through the cold early morning hours but he remarked that it was very uncomfortable the devotees went to the landlord and asked for a second heater the land when devotees went to the landlord and asked for a second heater the landlord's wife objected the landlord finally found a spare second heater but the kerosene fumes made the room too stuffy in addition the house was filled with a bad odor in that neighborhood there was an open sewage system a truck was supposed to come by with a vacuum cleaner and suck out the contents of the stool pits but the truck hadn't been there in over a week in anxiety that their spiritual master was suffering from much inconvenience the devotees went to the landlord and pleaded with him to do something about the stench the man was humble and accommodating and he respected propan as a spiritual leader he agreed to clean out the pits himself using hand buckets but the landlord's uh, wife again objected that her husband should make uh, such an extraordinary humiliating effort to accommodate shila propa the man did it anyway and the bad order disappeared on propa's last evening in the paper cottage he gave a public lecture the house had one floor plus a stage like mezzanine the speaker's desk was set on the stage along with a microphone the little dwelling was filled with guests and shila propa led kirtan and then began lecturing in english which at least some of his audience could understand in the midst of his talk the landlord's wife a small middle aged japanese lady entered the house and began screaming in anger a few devotees moved forward to stop her but she evaded them she walked up onto the stage beside shila propa making angry gestures and completely disrupting the meeting propa asked a guest who she was and what was the matter with her with her and he heard that the lady was a landlady and that she was angry that propa had made her husband clean out the stool pits when he understood propa broke into a grin he leaned forward and spoke into the microphone as if making an announcement japanese landlady he said and the audience and devotees relaxed and laughed it was as if by two words propa had made a philosophical statement examining the universal phenomenon of landladies and how they had to be tolerated after a pause propa continued his lecture and the landlady who had become disarmed by propa's smiling words went down the stairs and left the cottage the preaching is not an easy activity lots of difficulties but no pain no gain proper taught that he demonstrated that it is the duty of propans followers through the disciplic line coming from propa continuing from propa to also take up various difficulties um, sinlessly offenselessly assisting uh, shall propa's followers in nam in 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 chanting the holy names in serving them in serving the vaishnavas and in spreading the holy names also oh you are stealing from bhagwan shila prabhupada was very strong in his denunciation of materialists he would denounce even big industrialists as thieves everything belongs to krishna he said and the capitalists or communists have taken far more than their god given quota sometimes when disciples heard prabhupada's criticism they wondered how they could repeat such things to the non devotees prabhupada himself spoke with businessmen and on those occasions 
devotees would see his successful method of explaining to self-centered men the concept of Ishavasya, a God-centered society, on a morning walk around White Rock Lake. And devotees pointed out to Srila Prabhupada the mansion of one of the world's richest oil men. The white building on the spacious property was barely visible in the distance beyond the lake. Prabhupada didn't take much note of it as he walked along the shore, which was bordered on the water side with tall palm grass, while the road before them was littered with paper and beer cans. And this, a devotee described how he had tried to approach the oil billionaire to give him a Bhagavad Gita, but he had been successful only in giving a copy to one of the friendly entrance guards. What would you have said, asked Prabhupada, if you were actually able to see him? About 10 devotees walked with him and one spoke out. I would tell him that we have a school here in Dallas and that actually we are model citizens. What else would you say? Prabhupada asked. One devotee replied that she would invite him to visit the temple. And another said he would bring him prasada. No said Prabhupada, you should say to him, you are a big thief. You have taken for yourself so much oil, which all belongs to God. So now you will have to be punished. Prabhupada's followers felt embarrassed that they had not given Prabhupada such a strong answer. They were also surprised as the quiet morning walk continued. Prabhupada went on to say that one day the Lord of Death would come for the oil billionaire and no entrance guards could stop him. At that time, no matter what the richest man in the world might say, death would take him away to face his karma. Not long after Prabhupada's visit to Dallas, the Texas billionaire died. Some of the devotees remember Prabhupada's words and how they were never able to approach the man. One of the devotees present on the walk was Dayananda Das, who vividly recalled this whole incident years later when he witnessed Prabhupada in the presence of a wealthy industrialist. The scene was Mayapur, and Prabhupada was taking his morning walk on the roof of the residential building. Jayapataka Swami introduced Prabhupada to a prominent businessman who had come to visit from Calcutta. Speaking in English, Prabhupada greeted him pleasantly. I'm pleased to see you, said Prabhupada. Thank you for coming to Mayapur. So what is your factory? The businessman from Calcutta, a heavyset man, in an immaculate white dhoti kurta and vest, spoke in a loud voice. I manufacture glass, he said. Hmm, Prabhupada reflected. So where does the glass come from? The man was now walking beside Prabhupada, along with other devotees and friends, as they circumambulated the roof, talking and viewing the surrounding flatlands of Mayapur. It is from silicon, the man replied. It is from sand. Yes, said Prabhupada, but who owns the sand? The Calcutta man was not only an intelligent businessman, but he was pious and could understand what Bhaktivedanta Swami as guru was driving him. He said, oh, the sand comes from Bhagavan. Prabhupada replied quickly, oh, you're stealing from Bhagavan. Prabhupada's retort made everyone laugh. Even the industrialists could not help but join in the laughter. But the after the quick exchange, the Calcutta businessman dropped back, dropped toward the back of the group and others came forward to ask Prabhupada their philosophical questions. Prabhupada's morning walks were often this way, fragmented conversations with different guests and devotees who would come forward and ask Prabhupada some query. He would answer one after another, sometimes developing different themes and going from one theme to another. After walking for about half an hour, the industrialists again moved to the front for another round of questions with Prabhupada. He had been considering what Prabhupada had said and he felt a little guilty. Swamiji, the man offered, although I may be taking from Bhagavan, but I'm also giving in, but I'm giving in charity also. Prabhupada smiled and replied, oh, you're just a, just a little thief. Again, everyone on the walk laughed at Prabhupada's last word on the subject. That Srila Prabhupada showed the practical application of the theoretical advice he had given in Dallas. Your name is now Nisimananda Das. Is that all right? 
a young Californian man, David Shapiro, became attracted to Prabhupada through his books and through the devotees association. He then moved to the Los Angeles temple at a time when Prabhupada was visiting, but unfortunately, David's mother was outraged that her grown-up son had chosen to become a Krishna conscious devotee. A journalist, she went on a letter writing campaign against the Krishna consciousness movement. She wrote letters to the newspapers and also to government departments, complaining that her son was practicing too much renunciation in Krishna consciousness. And she felt this was a mistreatment. David tried to pacify her, but he was not very good at it. Most of the time he was washing pots in the temple kitchen or going out on chanting uh, parties downtown Nagar Kirtan. And he didn't remember or bother to phone his mother. The devotees in the temple didn't help much when they sometimes forgot to pass on messages from his mother. As part of her letter writing campaign, David's mother also wrote letters to Prabhupada. La Prabhupada replied to one of her letters, but she was not interested in any dialogue or consideration of her son's spiritual benefit as described by Prabhupada. She just wanted her son to return. Sensing that the Los Angeles temple could get into trouble through this woman, the temple president asked David to leave the temple. Although David was a submissive devotee, he refused to leave and began to cry. He said, I'm not initiated. I've been in this movement for a year, but I'm not initiated. So I don't have a link to my spiritual master. How can I leave the temple without a link? I may never come back. Both the temple president and David were bewildered. Prabhupada was then informed how the boy had refused to leave when he called him to his room. David came into Prabhupada's quarters and bowed down before him while Prabhupada was taking prasada. Prabhupada spoke mildly. So you have been having some difficulty with your mother? Yes, Srila Prabhupada. That's all right, said Prabhupada. I've decided to initiate you. Right on the spot, without any of the usual formal ceremony, Prabhupada gave David his new spiritual name. Your name is now Nrisimananda Das. Is that all right? Yeah, that. David could hardly speak. Prabhupada continued. I'm giving you this name, Nrisimhananda, because through this name, you will always be protected from your parents. Prabhupada then offered some prasadam from his plate to Nrisimhananda and said, now you can go home and stay there for some time. That'll be all right. I think you can make vegetarian prasadam there. Yes, said Nrisimhananda. So you can go for some time and also come back, said Prabhupada. Nisimananda understood Prabhupada's desire and he had faith that it would work. Thank you, Srila Prabhupada, he said and left. David Shapiro, now Nisimananda Das Brahmachari, returned to his mother's home. Ten months later, when both son and mother had gained a more mature outlook about Krishna consciousness, Nisimananda rejoined Prabhupada's movement, this time to stay. Little drops of nectar. The Prabhupada wanted devotees and guests to be attentive while he spoke on the Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. One day, when Prabhupada objected to a baby's crying, a person in the audience challenged, if you are a guru, why are you disturbed? Prabhupada replied, that it was the audience who was disturbed from attentive hearing. And that was why he had asked the baby's noises be stopped. Even when Prabhupada spoke Hindi, which most of his disciples could not understand, he expected them to stay and be quiet. He said that even if they couldn't understand the language, the sound vibration would purify them. The inconceivable potency. Inconceivable. Just like when we hear the various uh, Vedic mantras when they're recited by qualified persons and even if we don't understand what they mean if we have a genuine submissive attitude then it will help us uh, in spiritual progress one time in New Delhi while Prabhupada was speaking to a government minister and other guests in his room two of, two of his disciples created a disturbance Ramananda Swami was ill and needed the address of a doctor. So he entered the room to catch Tejas, Tejas' attention. At first, Tejas didn't want to speak at all, but Brahmananda insisted and poked him in the side. Tejas turned and gave the doctor's address, but Brahmananda requested more information, and the two of them began to argue. 
in response to the disturbance, Prabhupada stopped speaking. When the devotees looked at him, he was staring at the spot on the ceiling just above where they were sitting. Prabhupada then lowered his vision from the ceiling and looked straight and steady at the two offending disciples. It is very annoying to me, said Prabhupada. He shook his head with displeasure and added, it is very disconcerting. These last words were spoken in a soft tone, but with anger. The atmosphere of the room became very tense. The distinguished guests were looking at the boys and Prabhupada, and the boys were devastated. Prabhupada's displeasure continued unrelieved until suddenly another, another devotee entered the room and announced, Prabhupada, the car is ready. Only by Prabhupada's rising to exit for another engagement did he release his disciples from his instructive displeasure. Prabhupada also said it is the duty of the spiritual master to uh, correct the disciple if needed through chastisement, forceful chastisement also. In 1969, when Prabhupada stayed at John Lennon's estate, he liked to walk in the misty morning through the gardens and groves. It was there that Prabhupada met the head gardener, an old English gentleman who used to wear a tweed suit jacket even while digging in the earth. The gardener had shown no interest in the philosophy of the devotees, but when Prabhupada came, he was interested to meet him. On Prabhupada's first morning walk, the head gardener presented himself. Prabhupada was also dressed in a gentlemanly way, wearing a long black coat, black hat, and Wellington boots. I'm the head gardener here, said the man. Prabhupada said he was glad to meet him and asked him, what are you growing? The gardener eagerly showed Prabhupada some of the plants and fruits he was raising in the greenhouse, including watermelons and varieties of flowers. He also pulled out trays from underneath a greenhouse table and showed Prabhupada his mushrooms. Oh, we do not eat this, said Prabhupada. This is fungus. The man admitted that it was fungus. Prabhupada explained that, mung that mushrooms do not have a good taste and because they grow in a dark, damp place, they are considered food in the mode of ignorance. Shri Prabhupada then suggested that the gardener should try to grow lady, fing lady fingers, but the man didn't know what Prabhupada meant. Prabhupada pointed to his own fingers. He should grow these lady fingers. He gave the Hindi word bhindi which the man also couldn't understand. Finally, the gardener understood that Prabhupada was talking about okra. Prabhupada asked if the man could grow mangoes, but he said he couldn't, not even in the greenhouse. What is your age? asked Prabhupada. The gardener replied, he was 66. Prabhupada said, do you still have all your teeth? The gardener seemed to be a little embarrassed, but replied, no, I don't. I have all false teeth. My age is 72, said Prabhupada, but I have all my teeth. Prabhupada opened his mouth and showed. The gardener replied, I have lost all my teeth because I like sweet things too much. I also like sweets, said Prabhupada. I eat many sweets myself, rasgulla, gulab jamuns, but I'm eating the right kind of sweets. You should also eat these sweets. After that, when taking his morning walk, Prabhupada regularly greeted the gardener with a few words, but at least, Whenever the gardener was working at a distance, they exchanged a wave of hands. Perfect gentleman. The natural quality of a perfect pure Vaishnava. But they are instructions for us uh, that we need to learn to be dealing nicely with various, even non devotees with whom we may need to meet and uh, be a part of. Not that uh, because we have taken to Krishna consciousness, we are mean and irritating and uh, have a holier than thou attitude. You know, I am more pure than you. Not that kind of attitude. Pleasant. Pleasant. Respectful. Pleasant. Without being influenced by their lack of Krishna consciousness. That requires maturity which comes when you are blessed by Hari Guru Vaishnavas. More little drops of nectar 
Calcutta was Prabhupada's hometown. And even in the 1970s, when he had ISKCON centers in major cities all over the world, his visits to ISKCON Calcutta brought old friends and acquaintances to see him. One evening, he was sitting in his room with old family friends from the Mahatma Gandhi Road neighborhood where he had grown up. They insisted that he come and visit the Radha Govind, the temple. Although it was almost 10 p.m., Prabhupada uh, suddenly decided to go. So he traveled by car along with some of his Western disciples. As he passed his old neighborhood, he pointed out the house where he was raised as a child and the spot where he used to purchase kites at the Govindaji temple. Relatives came forward, embracing him and touching his feet. Old and young surrounded him, smiling and chatting. In Bengali, Prabhupada then went before the deity of Govinda, whom he had worshipped from the beginning of his life. Practically everything I have done, he explained to his disciples, is by the grace of Radha Govinda. He recalled his original Rathyatras up and down Mahatma Gandhi Road and how his father paid for the festival. Prabhupada said that the same spirit he had imbibed here, he was now carrying on throughout the world in Rathyatras and by establishing many Radha Govindajis all over the world. In India, when out walking or traveling, Prabhupada would often deal directly with merchants and laborers rather than allow his Western disciples to be cheated. One day, on leaving the temple grounds in Mayapur, accompanied by a few devotees, Prabhupada approached a rickshaw wala and asked him how much he wanted for a ride to Naudibhat. The rickshaw wala said two rupees and Prabhupada told him it was much too high. Why are you asking so much, Prabhupada argued. We are coming here to preach. We have brought devotees from all over the world. But the rickshawala said that two rupees was the final price. Prabhupada held his head high, turned to his disciples and said, we shall walk. The contemplated walk was several miles. But Prabhupada began to walk steadfastly and his disciples joined behind him. His walking pace continued strong and fast for a few minutes until the same rickshaw wala drove up, pulled in front of Prabhupada and stopped without speaking or even turning sideways. Prabhupada stepped up onto the rickshaw and went off victoriously at the one rupee price. So Prabhupada wanted to give one rupee, but this person wanted more than that. Okay, one more. Philip Prabhupada said on Deity worship. There is no question of using paper or plastic fruits and flowers for worshipping the deities. If no fresh fruits or flowers are available, then you can decorate with some fresh leaves. You have seen our temples. Nowhere do we use do we use such things. You are experienced devotee. Why do you propose like that? We are not after decoration. We are after devotional service for pleasing Krishna's senses. Decoration must be there, of course, to make the temple as opulent as possible for pleasing Krishna. Outside the temple, you can use the plastic ornaments, but not for worship. For daily worship, there must be fresh fruits, flowers, and leaves. Who is in charge of the deity room? It must be secured at night. Every window and door must be locked, and you must personally see to this. You have had sufficient experience at Dari place that the deity was attacked. You have already experienced that. So you should not be negligent in this manner, in this matter. Please see that adequate security is given to the temple, especially to the deities, so that they will not be exposed to any attack. Regarding your questions, it is not very good to put statues of Radha and Krishna on a shelf. If they are not worshipped as deities, what is the use of such display? Visitors will get the wrong idea that they are merely decorative figures or idols, that we do not take them very seriously. Why you do not worship them on the altar? The proper method of dressing Jagannath is as a Kshatriya king and there is no limit to the opulence you can give him. For a few years, Prabhupada traveled with small deities of Radha, Krishna. His personal servant and secretary were responsible for making arrangements for the Radha Krishna deities as Prabhupada moved from one location to another. On one occasion in India, when Prabhupada made a temporary stop, his servant did not unpack the deities. Prabhupada became angry and asked why the devotee had not unpacked. I didn't think it would be very rational. 
replied his servant, to unpack the deities in these conditions. Baba replied with a shout, you are unpacked and you are very comfortable. Sri Vigraha Radhana Nityanana Shingaratan Mandira Marjanado Yuktasya Bhaktam Shchini Yanjatopi Vande Guru Shri Charanaradhan Bhaktam. Okay. Uh, Okay. Any questions? One minute, one minute, one minute. Um, Bankim Govinda Prabhu. Prabhu Harishna. <coughs> Prabhu, Prabhu, you are mentioning about the word purity uh, and Prabhupada has emphasized that it's very much required for preaching. As well as in uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj, in the near other class as well, you were saying that uh, Maharaj was very specific about purity. Now, how do we develop purity, Prabhu? By progressing in Krishna consciousness, we become increasingly pure. There is something called spiritual progress. I think a number of us, we simply don't understand this. We think that we take some initiation, we do some daily duties, and we go on till we die. And after we die, you know, it's almost like Christian philosophy. We go to the kingdom of God. You know, everything is so sweet. It's a sweet imagination. We're living in our own delusion. There's something called progress. Until we reach Prema Bhakti, there's no point in being in Goloka Vrindavan also. It is a, it is a world of love for Krishna, as you will see, as you can see in Brad Bhagavatam. So there's no point in being in a place where we are just odd men and women out, you know, completely out of place. The whole idea is to get qualified to go there. But right now, when we take initiation, we have entered the stage of bhajana kriya. And for that, the progress to the next step, uh, we need to get out of various anarthas. For that, we need to avoid sinful activities and offenses. And we need to engage in the various items of devotional service. We get a good outline of it in Upadesha Amrita, but if you see the 64 items of devotional service, that also we get a good idea. Uh, we can go through those chapters and the nectar of devotion individually and we get a good idea. And when we do that, then the various uh, anarthas, lust, anger, greed, pride, envy, delusion, they will reduce. Uh, they should reduce. You know, just like you go to a doctor, you take treatment. Then the various symptoms of sickness, they will reduce. If it does not reduce, then, then what, what are you doing? You can't simply say, oh, you know, my doctor is such a nice person. Okay, your doctor is such a nice person. That's great. It's good news. But have you uh, progressed towards a healthy condition? This is what people will ask. So we are, you know, in order to give good name to our own spiritual masters and uh, in fact, if one wants to glorify his spiritual master, this is the best glorification he can give by agreeing to progress in Krishna consciousness. That uh, all the anarthas that are noted in noted to be anarthas in Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Chaitamrita, they reduce. And we develop spiritual taste, we develop renunciation, we develop detachment, we develop spiritual knowledge, understanding, realization. Um, we we are able to understand that Krishna consciousness is actually correct. We naturally develop a desire to share Krishna consciousness with others. We want uh, to become more and more involved in serving Krishna's name, form, qualities, pastimes. Um, in other words, the whole process of Krishna consciousness as set out in the books becomes alive. That is an indication that we are becoming pure. When we do the opposite, there are also activities by which we can degrade in Krishna consciousness. Then these things become smaller and smaller. And the anarthas that we are trying to avoid become bigger and bigger. So from that, that itself should send an alarm signal saying that I'm doing something wrong. I'm reversing. I'm reversing. I should not be reversing. I should not be regressing. I should be progressing. I came to Krishna consciousness for a particular reason. And I need to attain that goal. I need to move towards the goal, not move further away from the goal. 
um, when we actually try to progress in our chanting and become pure, more and more pure, uh, there are certain, uh, there are many ways by which we can, we get a sense of how we need to modify our environment. Uh, initially, we don't really understand all the nitty gritties about what to do and what not to do. It is very, very helpful if we have a more advanced devotee who is affectionate to us and um, who is spiritually like-minded, who has the same values that we have. And we take guidance from such a devotee, a trustworthy devotee. Then it's easier to progress because we can confirm many things. And what he or she says would naturally have to match with what has been set out by Prabhupada as well as the teachings of his predecessors, as well as the teachings of Shastra. So it'll all match. It's like when you go to a lawyer and uh, you take a legal counsel, then naturally, customarily, um, at least experienced senior lawyers, uh, for every point that they say, they will immediately bring a law book. And they'll say, see, look at this. This is where I'm developing this argument from. This, they don't try to hide things. Even though the client may not know so much of law, uh, they think it's their duty to explain it. And they think that, that uh, an intelligent client should learn enough law to win this case. So like that, uh, when we accept um, you know, devotees more advanced than us, who are affectionate to us, and uh, who are spiritually like-minded as our guides, then they will also be able to explain it in that way. This is actually the meaning of Sadhu Sangha. Sajati Yashi Snigde. Sadhu Sangha Swatah Vare. Rupa Goswami gives this threefold criteria. So, in that way, we first of all understand the roadmap of Krishna consciousness. Without that roadmap, we, we, just, we don't even know whether we are progressing, regressing. We're just doing something. And we are doing something which is far superior to what the non devotees are doing. That much we understand. Whatever it is, the life of Krishna consciousness is far superior to what these silly non-devotees are doing. They are hurting themselves and they're hurting others. They just don't know about what to do about it. They're stuck, they're addicted, they're stuck. And we have somehow been placed on a platform which is far superior to them. That much we understand. But there are, but if this much itself is um, so much beneficial. How much would it be if we, if we progress to a higher rung and a higher rung and a higher rung and a higher rung and a higher rung? At every level, as we go higher and higher and higher, we would be experiencing um, Krishna consciousness with increased freshness. And that is something that we will be able to experience when we do things properly. So that is how we begin to understand, oh, these are things which are favorable for Krishna consciousness, bhakti anukul. These are things which are unfavorable. These are actually uh, very beneficial. But these are very risky. So we begin to understand. Uh, after some time, we begin to understand. Okay, these things are okay, but they are dangerous, risky. These things are okay, and they are actually recommended. So we begin to understand. So when the Chaitya Guru uh, helps us understand that, then we become more and more convinced that I need to go forward in this particular manner. And we will see that when we do that, our lust, anger, and greed reduce. So from that itself, we understand just as when we eat more and more and more, our hunger reduces. Hunger is a sensation which you can understand the degree to which it is there. Thirst, also its presence, absence, increase or decrease can be sensed. Like that, uh, these uh, various anarthas, uh, we can understand whether they are uh, increasing or decreasing um, and so on. There are these various weeds that we need to protect ourselves from. Um, we also need to protect ourselves from the mad elephant offense of offending uh, perfect pure Vaishnavas and also even other pure devotees. And in just, just in general, be careful about offending devotees and non-devotees. Uh, in Krishna consciousness, we are attacking attitudes and activities, actually. We are not attacking any particular person. When the living entity turns away from Krishna, 
Maya Devi, through the three modes of material nature, makes uh, that particular living entity come up with a particular set of crazy ideas and activities. So it's not actually that person. It is that activity and that attitude that we are dealing with. So in the preaching mission, we gradually begin to understand all of these things, one by one by one. Purity is very, very important. Purity is a force. Um, it's very, very important. In fact, uh, as much as we have a, we have a book called Preaching is the Essence, a compilation of uh, statements by Prabhupada on the importance of preaching, published by BBT. I've begun work on a similar project called Purity is the Force, uh, looking into Prabhupada's statements on purity. And it is very huge compared to preaching. It is huge, you know, it's huge. Um, but it would be, it is very important. It is very important. Preaching is sharing Krishna consciousness. So if we don't share pure Krishna consciousness, we create a big mess. We create a big mess. So it is important that we spread Krishna's teachings unadulterated um, as it is. We ourselves are sadhakas. And when we share Krishna consciousness with others and make them into sadhakas, we should not forget that we are also sadhakas. Until we reach the point of full perfection, we cannot, how can we claim to be transparent via media when we are in fact translucent via media? Sadhakas can only be translucent via media. Uh, because you'll simply not be able to, even if you repeat Krishna's own instructions as it is, the effect won't be there. Brought up this point. Pure, the pure nectar of Harikatha, if it is coming from the mouth of a non Vaishnava, should not be heard. It is already pure. See, it is Putam Harikathamrita. It is pure Harikathamrita. It is not impure Harikathamrita. Impure Harikathamrita means when Krishna consciousness, topics of Krishna consciousness is mixed with Mayavad or mixed with something else. But even if it is not mixed, pure, then then it should not be heard from uh, the mouth of a non Vaishnava because his attitude is injected along with that communication. Therefore, it is not simply a matter of just sharing the information about Krishna consciousness. It is sharing that information along with our purity. Prabhupada wanted effective preachers. It is, and he used to say, purity is our only asset. Otherwise, what is there? In places like in India, and nowadays, in many places outside India also. Generally, people are aware about uh, many aspects of spiritual life. They know about reincarnation. They know about karma. And many things are known. But when a devotee with uh, sufficient purity speaks it, it does have an impact. And it is that impact that is referred to as the preaching mission of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That is what we need to be participating in. And it is our duty to do that. It is our duty to preach to ourselves first. And it is our duty to preach to those uh, with whom we are nearby, and it is our duty to preach to non-devotees. It is our duty to agree to be trained by our spiritual masters and other Vaishnava authorities uh, in order to become fully obedient to Prabhupada and Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati. It will certainly work, but um, it is with these criteria that we understand whether we are increasing our purity or decreasing our purity. There are many areas, many places in Prabhupada's books where he says, um, with this, a devotee can test whether he is progressing in Krishna consciousness. Right in Bhagavad Gita purpose, in Srimad Bhagavatam purpose also. So it is our duty to periodically examine, am I going forward or am I going backward? And that is a very valuable test, which we should uh, uh, always be doing. Always be on the alert. Always we should be on the alert. In that way, our service to the Vaishnava community is also reasonable. You know, we can give a good name to the Vaishnava community also. Purity is a very important matter. It is a very important matter. Thank you, Prabhu. Okay. Anything else? Shailesh Prabhu. 
Thank you, Shmuel. I don't know if I pronounce it. I'm going to show it. Um, just taking up uh, a point you just uh, mentioned um, um, about uh, when practicing, and uh, we, you, you say we feel that we're apparently coming uh, across more and more and more obstacles and anarthas, and maybe we're doing something wrong. I've heard from my Guru Maharaj and from Bhagavatam, etc., and the stories in Bhagavatam that constant. Um, um, you know, so negative uh, aspects that may come into your life may uh, are, are be treated as Krishna's mercy, uh, not as necessarily that we. Uh, yes, of course, it, it depends on our consciousness and our purity in, in, in action. But just because you're coming across more and more on earth, that may not necessarily mean that your practice in Krishna consciousness is, is something wrong with it. I mean, from what my Guru Maharaj just said, is that look, when Krishna is pleased with you, he gives you something. When he's more pleased with you, he, he takes he takes it away, and when he's uh, very pleased with you, he takes everything you want. So you know, how, how do we square off what you're saying in terms of uh, assessing if more and others are coming our way? That actually, there's I mean, yes, of course, our consciousness reservation should be we're always doing something wrong. We're never pure. But why why could we not see that as Krishna's mercy? Uh, and continue rather than trying to have to reass reassess. I, I appreciate as Vaishnavas, we should always be reassessing to make ourselves better. But there's a slight contradiction in, in what you said compared to what we learn from stories in Sastra, what we hear from Acharyas uh, in terms of you know treating these as Krishna's mercy. Perhaps you can just clarify and maybe, maybe dispel my ignorance on this point. Bro. by anarthas I am having in mind uh, let me show you what I mean by anarthas Bhaktivinoda Thakur has defined what anarthas are Maya Mudhasya Jeevasya Gyeyo Narthas Chaturvidaha Hriddaur Balyam Chaparatho Satrishna Tattu Vibhramaha The anarthas of the living entities enchanted by Maya are of four kinds. Misconceptions about reality, inappropriate desires, offenses, and weaknesses of heart. Swa Tattve Paratattve Cha Sadhya Sadhana Tattva Yo Virodhi Vishaya Chaiva Tattva Brahmas Chaturvita. There are four kinds of misconceptions about reality. Misconceptions regarding the nature of the Jiva. Misconceptions regarding the nature of the Supreme Lord. Misconceptions about the nature of the goal of spiritual life and the means to attain that goal. And misconceptions about the nature of obstacles to spiritual progress. Aihi ke shvaishana paratrikeshu chaishana shubha. There are four types of inappropriate desires. Desires for material pleasures attainable in this life. Desires for auspicious material pleasures attainable in the next life. Desires for mystic paths and desires for liberation. Krishna nama swarupe shuttadiya chitkane shucha yeya buddhagane nityam aparadhas chaturvidha. The learner should always understand that the four kinds of offenses are Offenses to Krishna's holy name, offenses to Krishna's deity form, offenses to his devotees, and offenses to the jivas who are Krishna's spiritual parts and parcels. The learner should always understand that weakness of heart is of four kinds attachment for the insignificant, hypocrisy or deceit, envy and desire for prestige or position. Now, this is not the only place where we come across all this. We also come across this in, uh, okay, wait, let me take it out from, Chaitanya Chaitanya 
This is the Lord's teachings to do. Rupa Goswami. When a person receives a seed of devotion service, he should take care of it by becoming a gardener and sowing the seed in his heart. He waters the seed gradually by the process of shravan and kirtan, hearing and chanting. The seed if he waters the seed gradually by the process of shravan and kirtan, hearing and chanting, the seed will begin to sprout and then it reaches up to Goloka Vrindavan. Being situated in his heart and being watered by shravan kirtan, the bhakti creeper grows more and more. In this way, it, it attains the shelter of the desire tree of the lotus feet of Krishna, who is eternally situated in the planet known as Goloka Vrindavan, in the topmost region of the spiritual sky. And then here is a description of the mad elephant offense by which the creeper is uprooted and broken. So we need to do something by which the mad elephant offense doesn't take place at all. Now, okay, then sometimes unwanted creepers such as the creepers of desires for material enjoyment and liberation from the material world grow along with the creeper of devotion service some unnecessary creepers growing with the bhakti creeper are the creepers of behavior unacceptable for those trying to attain perfection, diplomatic behavior, animal killing, mundane profiteering, mundane adoration, and mundane importance. All these are unwanted creepers. If one does not distinguish between the bhakti creeper and the other creepers, the sprinkling of water is misused because the other creepers are nourished while the bhakti creeper is curtailed. As soon as an intelligent devotee sees an unwanted creeper growing beside the original creeper, he must cut it down instantly. Then the real creeper, the Bhakti Lata, grows nicely, returns home, back to Godhead, and seeks shelter under the lotus feet of Krishna. So these unwanted creepers, they are the ones. That's what we are referring to by anarthas. We need to do something by which these anarthas reduce and in fact go away. Anarthas are certainly not because of Krishna's mercy. It is because of our aversion to Krishna that uh, Maya Devi has actually blessed us with these, with these anarthas. And it is our responsibility to ensure that we become freed from this. From Krishna, we get various uh, forms of help and those who are especially begging Krishna for spiritual progress, uh, Krishna will take away things which feed these anarthas. So that is different. The obstacles, external obstacles that we face, they are to be distinguished from these internal anarthas, which we have developed for millions of lifetimes while in material existence. So it is our responsibility to undo. And we don't, we just need to do, we need to ensure that we carry out Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's instructions as coming down through the spiritual master and other Vaishnava authorities carefully in such a manner that we become more, more pure. Krishna will help. Uh, the obstacles that uh, Krishna gives, these are external situations. These are external situations. The external situations are coming by Krishna's arrangement and they are to be taken as challenges. Uh, do we really want anartha nivriti, uh, nishtha, ruchi, asakti and so on? So Krishna tests us. He presents situations where we can choose to continue to grow our anarthas or decide to grow in Krishna consciousness, not grow our anarthas. 
that is you know for that krishna is always going to help and he will always present some challenge um, you know where we are led to that point you know you choose what do you want and krishna and the spiritual masters and the parampara acharyas as well as the vaishnavas everybody is going to encourage us come let's choose krishna let us go with this let us go with this now sometimes anurtha nivritti happens through externally distressing uh, situations but sometimes anurtha nivritti can happen through externally happy situations it's not that everybody has to go through yasya uh, ahamana krishnami harishe tad dhanam shanai sudama vipra for instance he was given wealth he was not his you know he was already poor at this or uh, various situations sometimes krishna decides that for certain persons i need to give things in order to help him progress for someone else krishna may decide to um, take away things therefore bhishma dev also tells in the first canto that it's very difficult to understand um, krishna's will what exactly he wants to do but whatever it is it is to help us progress in krishna consciousness and progressing in krishna consciousness will naturally um, involve saying yes to krishna and saying no to maya specifically to what the acharyas have identified as anarthas unwanted activities and attitudes which prevent us from progressing towards prema bhakti is that clear um yes prabhu i mean i think it's a, it's it's it, it seems to lie largely in the the definitions you pulled out which are quite useful of of the 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 anarthas Uh, it would be useful if you could send us a link or a copy of the the, the definitions you pulled pulled out a little earlier, because that that was certainly very use, useful. So yeah, it it comes in anyway. I'll put it out in the Telegram group. You can check it in Vajan Rahasya. Comes there. All right. Thank you. Ancha kalpatar yeshil pasan dhiye vacha patitanam pavanibhyo vaishnavibhyo ramo maha. Thank <laughs> you.